Uh, we're going to get into the scripture in just a, a few moments, uh, but let me just um, give you a quick little, you know, bring you up to speed on something that we're working on, and uh, you'll be excited to hear uh, some of the news that we have happening here. If you've walked up um, the sidewalk here, or you saw it in the parking lot, you looked over to the grass, you would notice that we've got some stakes in the ground, and there's some ribbons kind of marking out an area that we're building uh, as a ministry center primarily for our youth and primarily for young adults and other discipleship needs that we've got here at the church. And so you, you're hopefully seeing that emerge. We encourage you, go walk through that, um, even if it's not built yet. Just go walk through that space and kind of get a feel for what's happening there and pray through it because we really believe God's going to do some extraordinary things in the future uh, in our young people around this city, and that's going to be one key place that that happens. And so thanks for your investment in that and your giving. There's still opportunity for you. If you'd say, I'd like to give towards that, as you start to see it even kind of moving and things happening over there, it's a great visual reminder. Let's continue to give. We're really, we're really close to being able to do that all for cash. In other words, not to have to finance anything, to do it for cash. And so let's, let's push it and, and get to the end and do that together. We've had some really cool things take place over the last couple of weeks. Um, our permits have been sent off to the city and they're evaluating those and we should have those back soon and be able to break ground within the next uh, couple weeks to a month. And then um, we've had individuals out doing some site work and leveling things and, and excavators come out to look at it, what his task is gonna be once we get the go ahead. And then this last week, we got some really good news um, from uh, a donor that uh, basically took care of, uh, with a slight exception of a few pieces of this puzzle, uh, took care of the majority of the lumber. Just uh, We have a donated lumber pack uh, for this process, and so that's a pretty incredible thing. And, uh, and we're grateful to the Lord, and we love that people are investing in that and, uh, and feel this tug to try to minister to the next generation. So let's continue to invest in that. This is good work, and there's good people, maybe not even the ones that we necessarily see right now, but there's a generation that we're trying to reach, and I think this is going to be a great opportunity to do that. So Praise God. Amen? All right. Let's get into the scripture. Go to the book of Colossians, if you would, in the New Testament. Colossians chapter 1. We're about six weeks into this series that we're calling Supreme. Uh, six weeks in, and this is a letter written by the Apostle Paul to the church in Colossae. And uh, he wrote it with some very specific intents and, and uh, specific purposes behind it. And we're starting to get into that now. We're starting to see some of the reasoning behind why he wrote this particular letter. Like any letter from the Apostle Paul, um, I say like any letter. So really, it's a, there's a classic format that starts to um, kind of be revealed within this text, as we see in a lot of Paul's texts. That is that he will start out with a greeting. We saw that in verses 1 and 2. There was a, a classic greeting to the church. And then we see uh, from verses 3 to about 14 is, he, is a prayer. Okay, He prays this impacting, kind of heartfelt, fervent prayer for that church, which we, by and large, get to find ourselves in the middle of, a prayer from Paul even towards us. And then you get into verses 15 through 20, and we've got an inspiring hymn. He leads the church in a song, basically. It's a hymn with two stanzas. Over the last couple weeks, we've looked at this particular hymn. We've unpacked it. And I love this kind of grid. It sounds like Pastor Paul is, is doing what we do in churches just kind of instinctively, right? We get together. We say hello. We sing some songs. We pray. We open the scripture together. We bless you and send you home, hopefully endeavoring to live like Jesus, in the week ahead. And then we gather up again the next week. There's this pattern to it. And, and I, I, I don't know that you do this as much as I do, but I study the church. Like, I'm always thinking about the church. I'll, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna hazard a guess that you don't think about it nearly as much as I do, okay? Um, but I'm always thinking about this organization and how we do things. And, and the longer I'm in this, the more I'm endeavoring to want to be creative and want to think through new ways to communicate and, and uh, structure things. But, but ultimately, when you kind of boil this thing down, you get to some common denominators that you just can't really argue with. I mean, we're going to pray. We're going to sing songs to Jesus. We're going to open the Bible and talk about what the Word of God says to us in our lives right now. We're going to pray again and send you out and ask that you would live like Jesus in the week uh, forward. And then we'll gather up again next week. We're just going to continue to do this, okay? We got to pace ourselves, right? We don't have to work too hard. We don't have to go at this thing too fast. I was talking uh, a while ago with 
a young pastor just beginning out in his church, and I happened to be visiting his church the first few weeks into his pastorate. And, um, and after the message, I said, man, that was really great. I just got to tell you, though, uh, you pretty much got up there and, and you preached from Genesis to Revelation this morning. You know, you went from the first book of the Bible to the last book of the Bible. You even hit a little Leviticus and Numbers in there. It was pretty incredible what you just did. I said this question. I said, what are you going to preach next week? He goes, I don't know. That took everything I got to get to this week right now. Okay, slow down. Pace yourself. Okay, we're in this for the long haul. Uh, periodically, I'll get folks that come up to me after a service, after a message, and they go, hey, pastor, I just wanted you to know, man, you really, you missed uh, uh, you know, Joel chapter 2, verse 23, where it says this and this, and I'm like, thank you. That's a, that's a great verse, man, for you. Um, that's a wonderful verse that you should go home and read. And, and uh, you know, we, we, we can't get to everything. We're just going to go slow. We're going to realize that barring the return of Jesus, we'll be back together next week, Okay. And the Apostle Paul, I think, takes this kind of long view of things, and he just begins to, to just work through something methodically, slowly, carefully. And we're going to do the same today as we look at three verses, verses 21 through 23. I think what the Apostle Paul does in these three verses is he lays out a thesis. He lays out an outline to work from in the rest of the book. It's interesting how this happens. The first two verses are a greeting. You've got a bunch of prayers. You've got a song that he sings with two verses. And then you've got this thesis statement, like this is what I'm gonna say. And if you've ever written a paper, you know, for your grad degree or whatever it is, a high school paper, college paper, whatever, you know you start out at the top with a thesis. This is what I'm gonna say. And then you say it. And then at the very end, you say everything you just said. Right? That's how you write a paper. That's very simple. That's how you do it. The Apostle Paul's going to do the same thing. He's given us a thesis statement here, and then he expounds upon this outline in the remainder of the book. Let's look at it together. Verses 21 through 23. And you can follow along on the screen. You can follow along in your Bible. You also could hop onto like your YouVersion app and follow along under live events. It says, once you were alienated from God and you were enemies in your minds because of your evil behavior, but now... He has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you holy in his sight without blemish and free from accusation. If you continue in your faith, established and firm, and don't move from the hope held out in the gospel, this is the gospel that you heard and that has been proclaimed to every creature under heaven and of which I, Paul, have become a servant." Let's begin at the end there. And of which I, Paul, have become a servant, a servant, a doulos, a slave to this. I have given my life to this gospel, Paul says. I am committed to it. This gospel matters. This gospel is important. I am, I am giving of my heart and my lifeblood to serve this gospel and to speak it. And as a matter of fact, Paul would go so far as to say, and I'm kind of adding some things into this text so you can understand what he's getting at. Paul is saying, I serve this gospel. It doesn't serve me. Okay, this gospel changes me. I don't change it. I don't come along and tweak with it and try to make it better and, and rev it up a little bit. No, no, no. This gospel, it changes my heart and life. I don't come along and try to change it. And early on, we're going to find out that Paul speaks to the fact that there's a true message of the gospel, which seems to denote, friends, if you think of something being true, is it immediately calls to mind, well, there's got to be something, what? False, right? So you've got good news. And you got fake news, right? Okay. So he's saying the good news, the gospel of Jesus Christ, it's true. And everything else is false. We also find out something here in the very first few uh, verses of this book is that this gospel, it says, is growing and it's bearing fruit all over the world. In other words, this gospel has power, it has intentionality, and when it leaves the mouth of the messenger, it goes out and changes people's lives. I don't know how many of you have ever said something that the moment it came out of your mouth, it just kind of went, bloomp, and just hit with a thud on the ground. 
You know what I'm saying? Like you say something and the next thing you hear is this inaudible voice of like, womp, 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 you know? I, uh, have you ever dated? You ever dated and felt like you're getting close to wanting to say those special words to that person? You're like, you know, I've been mean to tell you something. I love you. And the person looks at you and goes, thank you. <laughs> the, what? No, no, what? Say something back, you know, as it reciprocate. I, I want to hear the words back. And it says, if you spoke and it just went thud. Well, the, the message of the gospel doesn't go thud. The message of the gospel reverberates out and it changes lives and it, it moves and it grows. It's active and it's alive. This message has to flow through a messenger. And if you've ever delivered a message to someone, maybe someone like higher up said, hey, go tell, go tell everybody what I'm saying. And you tell everybody and the next phrase out of your mouth is, hey, don't shoot the messenger, right? Don't shoot the messenger. In other words, I got this from someone higher up. I'm just bringing the message. And the Apostle Paul is saying, I have a message. It is the gospel, and the gospel is growing. It is active, and it's alive. But up until this point, we actually didn't know in this letter what the gospel was or is. It isn't until now, in these three verses, that Paul says, this is the gospel. It's like we've been hearing about this gospel. It's good news. And now we know this is what he is saying. This is where he clearly spells out the true gospel message. If you're taking notes on anything today, this is what you should take notes on. I'm gonna give you the gospel. Here is the gospel in a nutshell. Help, I'm trapped in a nutshell. Okay, here it is. Here it is. The gospel is this. You were once alienated from God, but you are now reconciled in Christ. That's the gospel. Let me give it to you again. Make sure you capture it. You were once alienated from God, but now you are reconciled through Christ. This, my friends, is the pure and simple gospel message. Let me encourage you. Don't add anything to it. Don't take anything from it. It's fine just the way it is. Oh, sure, I summarized it in a sense, and I maybe wordsmithed it just a little bit to give it to you in a concise format. But the reality is, is that the message we've just heard about being alienated from God, but now we are reconciled through Christ is the pure and simple gospel. Don't tweak with it. It's perfect. I don't know if you know this about me, but I'm a bit of a foodie. I'm a bit of a foodie. I love to go places, and, and if I'm in different cities, I will always, I'll just always yelp. I'll just go yelp. I'll be like, what's hot in this city right now for food? What's getting stars? What's getting reviews? And I'll go find these places, and most of them are cheap eats. How many just love cheap eats? But they're awesome. You're like, oh man, a couple bucks, and I'm getting this, this amazing food. So the majority of my you know, foodie kind of finds are cheap eats. There's a rare exception, though. The rare exceptions are when I'm with my best friend, Tim Clark, and we go to various cities, and he, it takes a foodie kind of, you know, hunt to a whole new level. He lives in Los Angeles. When I visit him in Los Angeles, we go places that are top-rated, these kind of places that people are talking about. They're like the, the city's best kind of places. And we'll find them, and I'll go, man, I heard about that. I was listening to a podcast. I was reading a blog about that. Are, did we get in? Yes, I got us in. The reservations are like a month and a half out, but I found a way. I got through. I've got a buddy. And we end up going to these places and we sit there and we'll eat this food. And I'll be like, man, this is the most incredible food I've ever. Let me tell you one example of one. In Jerusalem, Jerusalem, we'll be in Jerusalem next week with a whole group of people from our church. And I, I just, I'm salivating even thinking about this place. A couple years ago, we went there to a place called Makiuna. Makiuna is in Jerusalem and it is a t in a top five restaurant in the world. In the world. It's unbelievable. And I've recognized something about Makinuda, and I've recognized something about different places that we go to, and that we don't go often, but sometimes when you splurge, you go to these places, and you sit down, and you eat this incredible food, and I've recognized something consistent about these places. 
I've looked and looked and looked, and the majority of them do not have salt and pepper on the table. You look, and if you were to ask, uh, excuse me, can I get some, just some salt and pepper and, and maybe a little Tabasco too, just that, the green one, you know the green one? The room will turn. The music, the music will be like, it comes down to nothing and everyone looks at you and they wait to see what the reply of that server is going to be. When you realize you have asked the worst thing, why? Because in places like this, those chefs have created a cuisine that we, you, and me ought not mess with. Why? It's perfect. It's perfect. Now, if that works in the culinary field, how much more in the kingdom of God, in which God has created a message, a gospel message, a saving, redeeming call to each and every person. You may say, well, I like a little more of this. I like a little more of this. No, no, it's not about what you want. It's about what you need. And you and I need salvation. And God created a plan for us that's perfect. You and I were once alienated from God and now we have been reconciled through Christ. That is the gospel. You know, when you flip through your social networks, and you're just kind of killing time, and you're looking through photos on Instagram, on Facebook, you'll stumble across, every once in a while, you'll stumble across those pictures that have side-by-side photos. You know which one I'm talking about? This was the before. This is the after shot, right? This is what this person looked like a while ago. This is what they look like now. When you look at those pictures, when you look at those Before and after shots, these snapshots, they represent transformation, don't they? You can see a person's life then, and you can look at it now. You can clearly see that there's a a change. Snapshots, Snapshots, rather, like that are just that. They're just snapshots. They're just glimpses, moments that have been captured, moments that represent something then and something now. They don't show all the in between, do they? They don't show all the ups and downs. They don't show the frustrations. They don't show all of the hours sitting on the couch with your head in a Dorito bag. They don't show any of that. They don't show the losses. They don't show the disappointments and the failures. I can think about uh, recently I was trying to dump some photos off my phone to make some room and and I went back a ways and I found a picture that I'd taken of myself. Yes, friends, I took a mere selfie with no shirt on. So I stood there, no shirt on, took a mere selfie. I was just preparing to enter into a season where I was gonna do this kind of workout program and have this kind of an eating plan, and I was just gonna document this. I found that picture. I looked at that picture and I realized something. I still look the same. (laughs) I still look the same. I see friends, when we look at ourselves in those snapshots, we don't know the narrative. We don't know what's going on in between. We can't sit down and talk and say, well, tell me the story of how you got from here to there. We don't have that kind of time in this kind of a room. But you can in your small groups, in your fellowship gatherings, you can sit down and say, you know what? This was what my life was then. This is what my life is like now. This is what I have a desire and a dream to become down the road. And it's those three snapshots that the Apostle Paul gives us in these three verses. Remember it says it's a thesis or it's an outline and it has to do with what we once were, who we are now, and what we're becoming. Let's look at these verses together. Starting with the first one, verse 21. It says, once you were alienated from God and you were enemies in your minds because of your evil behavior. Let's talk about what we once were. What we once were. The scripture says you were alienated. You were separated from God. I love how Celine Dion puts it. You know, she goes, near, far, <laughs> wherever you are, right? Okay, it's what I mean. Listen, I just sang for you people, and that's what I get. I get one clap for my wife. <laughs> my goodness, come on. No, I don't want it now. I don't want it now. No, it doesn't count now. I'll give you another shot later. Okay. 
what we once were. In the book of Romans, Paul has some language that he gives us, and it's dark language. It's not, it's not happy language. In, in chapter one, he starts to paint this really desperate picture of what we once were. All of Romans chapter one is really a, a pretty sad chapter. It talks about the, the falling apart of, of not only our culture, but a falling apart really of our own humanity. That we would choose to do things that are so distant from God. And I'm gonna pick it up in verse 28 and just kind of carry it forward for a few verses that kind of summarize this. He says this, and then God gave them over to a depraved mind so that they do what they ought not be doing. Their lives become full of every kind of wickedness, sin, greed, hate, envy, murder, quarreling, deception, malicious behavior, and gossip. He goes on. He gives us more in case you want more. Here it is. They're backstabbers, haters of God, rude, proud, and boastful. They invent new ways of sinning. And they disobey their parents. I love how he sneaks that in there, right? It's like, you're creating all these new ways of sinning, but you haven't forgot the old one. You keep disobeying your parents. And then it goes on. It says, they refuse to understand. They break their promises. They're heartless. They have no mercy. They know God's justice requires that those who do these things deserve to die, and yet they do them anyway. Worse yet, they encourage others to do the same. I mean, that's how bad this has gotten. Paul in Romans chapter one is describing this, this people that just, they have to create new ways to sin. They're teaching everyone else how to do the same things they're doing. You're just seeing the snowball of disgustingness. You know what I'm saying? And then let's just keep ripping the bandaid off a little bit further because in Ephesians chapter two, Paul's speaking to the Gentiles, which were non-Jews, and he's talking to them in this way. He's saying, listen, I want you to remember, and this is a key word, remember. Remember that at one time, you were separate from God, excluded from citizenship, foreigners to the covenant promise. And you were without hope and you were without God in this world. Just remember that. Remember what you once were. Remember what you once were, separated, excluded, foreigners, without God, without hope. It was uh, Charles Spurgeon that said, you cannot slander human nature. It is worse than words can paint it. Okay? Human nature. Friends, we, we, we could go on and on and on and talk about the depravity of mankind. But here's the bottom line. We can summarize it with this phrase. You were once alienated from God. That's what we once were. Now let's talk secondly about where we now stand. Okay, Paul's transitioning to this second thought. This is where you now stand. Verses 20, verse 22 says this. But now, but now he, I like to summarize it this way. But God has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you holy in his sight without blemish and free from accusation. But God, but God. Those are my two favorite words in all the Bible. Did you know that? I've talked about this before. But God. When you think about everything that once was, every way we used to live, all the thoughts we used to have, all the sin we used to create, we used to teach other people to do, that was then. But this is now. This is where we now stand. And the reason we can stand in this place confidently is because of but God. I talked about this phrase, these two words, years ago. And uh, after talking about it, I had people make T-shirts. I didn't, I didn't instruct them to do this. But in the weeks that followed, I kept getting these individuals coming up and going, I made a T-shirt. just says, but God on it. And they give me these t-shirts. I'm like, thanks, I'll put that with the rest of them. And I kept getting shirts. It was so cool. Thank you for those of you that made those. These shirts remind us, but God, what did God do? The Bible says God reconciled you and I to himself through Jesus. What does it mean to be reconciled? To be reconciled with God means this. 
It means we return back. We have a way of returning back to a relationship with God that we were created to live in and to enjoy fully. It's a return back. In other words, if you, it harkens back to the days of the Garden of Eden, right? When, when it speaks of Adam and Eve walking with God in the cool of the day, they were naked, they were unashamed, the Bible says. They're just chilling with Jesus or with God, the Father, just walking around. And then something happened, right? It was a willful decision to disobey the Lord. And the first thing they recognized right out of the gate is, whoa, we're buck naked. Let's cover these things up. And they started running around covering up. See, right away, sin led to shame. But what happens through the reconciliation of the father is that he gives us a way to get back to relationship that was meant to be enjoyed in the first place. It's a return back to intimacy with God. You know, friends, when you reconcile something, right? When you make a relationship right, you reconcile it. Or some of you will sit down with bank statements and you'll reconcile your accounts. You'll look at what's written here, what the bank says you have, and you compare it to what you think you have, right? And, and the goal is, is you want things to be the way they're supposed to be. We were never intended to be outside of relationship with God. The reconciliation brings us back. We were once separated, aliens, completely pulled away through sin and through shame, and now we're brought back into relationship. So here's, here's how I would say this. I would say that sin, sin, it brought us this alienation. Sin is what did that, okay? But what Jesus did is Jesus bought us our reconciliation. Sin brought us alienation and separation. Jesus bought with his blood on the cross, bought us relationship, bought us reconciliation. And the cross really is the crux here. The cross becomes this, this bridge, if you will. If you kind of picture that beam that goes straight across, the cross becomes a bridge of reconciliation over troubled waters to God, right? I just did bridge over troubled waters there. I don't know if you caught that, but um, <laughs> it's, you're crossing over from this side in sin and shame to now back into relationship with God the Father through the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Here's how I love, I love how the Bible puts it. In Romans chapter five, Paul again, he talks about this bridge in a sense. He talks about this reconciliation that took place. He says this, you see, just at the right time, when we were still powerless, in other words, when we were still alienated and separated from God, it said Christ died for the ungodly. That's what he did. It goes on and says, very rarely will someone die for a righteous person, let alone a bad person. And then these two words jump up again. Here they are. But God, say that with me. But God, let's do it one more time, really loud. But God demonstrates, not just demonstrated, but continues to demonstrate his love for us in this, that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. A couple verses later in verse 10, it reminds us again that while we were God's enemies, we were reconciled, we were brought back into relationship with him through the death of his son. So this reconciliation is a really important part of, of our faith. We've been brought back into a relationship that we're always intended to live in and to enjoy. And then the scripture goes on and says, and he presents you. He presents you to God. Now this is a legal kind of a term. It's a language found in the courts. To be presented before a court means that you're, you're brought forward and you have to be judged, right? You've got, something's gotta be determined about you, but this is very different because in this case, you and I, since we found Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, not everyone in this room has, but by and large, the majority of us have, since we found Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, we're now presented before God, and the scripture says we're presented three things, as holy, without blemish, and free from accusation. Okay, we're holy. That's, we aren't drug into this courtroom wearing a, a, a bright orange jumpsuit with chains, disheveled hair, you know, sit down, you know, forced and pushed around. No, no, we stand now before God, the Bible says, because of Jesus, we stand holy, without blemish, 
and free from accusation. The idea of free from accusation, it means to be, uh, to be, to be standing before a righteous judge and that judge will bring the, the, the gavel down and will declare there is no more accusation against this person. They're completely free. Now, the Bible tells us something about our adversary. This is the devil I'm talking about. The Bible says that the devil has a name. He's been called the accuser of the brethren. You ever heard that phrase? The accuser of the brethren. So here's the, one of the primary tasks of the enemy. The enemy would like to tell you on a regular basis everything that you have done wrong. Like with a big old bony crooked finger to be able to point at you and go, this is who you are. This is what you've done. This is what you're thinking about right now. I saw what you did there. Oh, I know what you were thinking about last night. I know what you did last night. And he goes on and on and on and on and on and on. The accuser of the brethren. Here's what I would recommend to you today as a, as a response, okay? As a response, that when the accuser of the brethren, and we know that doesn't happen physically. We know it happens in our heart. We know it happens in our mind. We know that we're in one of these weak places where we're feeling shame and disconnect from God, that we just, he's digging all that stuff back up, right? Okay? We can stand there. And we can look the enemy in the eye, if you will, as that accuser is saying all these things, and we can look him in the eye and go, yep, you're right. Got me. Busted. But here's the problem, buddy. Your timing is off. Your timing is off because that is what I once was. That's not who I am now, okay? That's what I once was. I once was alienated from God. I want, and we can go back at that list in Romans chapter one and talk about all those things that we once did. And we could stand confidently before the enemy of our soul and look him down. And we don't have to start duking. We don't have to start swinging because this is not something we fight in the flesh. This is us standing there going, here's the, here's the problem. Your timing is off. And now you've got one standing right in front of me who's taking these blows from you. His name is Jesus. He's now my righteousness. He's now my covering. And so when you're coming at me, you're coming at me as what I used to be. Now I stand as a child of the living God, but God. We are now holy. We are now without blemish. We are now free from the accusations of the enemy. When those men drug that woman into the, the market square and threw her down before Jesus out of John chapter eight and said this woman was caught in the very act of adultery. We talked about this just a couple weeks ago. Jesus had some words to say to them and the men all one by one by one dropped the stones that they were gonna throw at her to kill her according to the law. They all dropped the stones and they walked away. The first words out of Jesus' mouth he looked at this woman and said, woman, where are your accusers now? Where are your accusers now? And she lifted her eyes, looked around, and they were gone. And the only one she could see was the face of Jesus. Jesus could have chimed in. Jesus could have said to her, young lady, man, you messed up. Gosh, Look at all these rocks that are all around here. I've got plenty of ammunition to throw at you. If anyone could have chimed in on the chorus of accusations, it could have been Jesus, the righteous one, the holy one. And yet he looks at her and says, woman, where are your accusers now? And then the follow-up is this. Go, as in you're forgiven, and sin no more. There was a call to righteousness because, see, Jesus isn't one who's just looking at us and saying, go, do whatever you want. I've got a whole bunch of love. It's become sloppy agape. It becomes this grace that just kind of oozes out of me. Romans says this, man, if grace abounds, should we just keep on sinning? And Paul says, no, don't keep on sinning. Because we want to live in a certain way as being people that honor God with our lives. We know what we were. 
We know where we now stand right at this moment. We know. But then we get to this third element, and the third element is so important. It's where should we go now? Where should we go now? Near, far, wherever you are, I believe that the heart goes on, right? The heart does go on, but where does it go on? Where should it go on? Because if we're left to our own devices, we will take our heart to places that lead us to more shame and separation from the Lord. That's a given. Okay, the Bible says there's a way that seems right unto man, and in the end, it leads to destruction. So we don't want to just follow our heart. What we want to do is we want to follow the leading of the Lord. How should we go on? Knowing that we have a past, and every one of us have to acknowledge it, and I don't know if your past was heinous or if it was just really, really sanitized. Some of you may look at your past and go, man, I probably should go out and sin some more so I have a good testimony. No, don't do that. Don't do that. Th just consider this. Regardless of what you have done, you were still separated from the Father. Regardless. There's no gradient of sins. God doesn't look at it and go, whoa, if you did this, you're way at the back of the line. No. Consider, though, what you once were. Now, where do you stand? And then the future how are you going to go on and live in such a way that's honoring to the Lord? The gospel of Jesus Christ is so important for us to hold on to. Verse 23 says, if you continue in your faith, established and firm, and don't move from the hope held out in the gospel. Here's how I'd summarize that, friends. I wish I could catch everyone's eyes and just say this to you personally. Here's what I think this is saying to us. Don't give up. Don't give up. Stay the course. Stay firm and steady in this thing. Don't, don't find yourself reverting backwards to what you once were. Continue in the faith, the Bible says. Stay steady and firm. Hold on to the hope of the gospel which, what is the gospel again? The gospel is, you were once alienated from God, but now you're reconciled through Christ. Don't give that up. Hold on to it. And you say, what do you mean give it up? How can I give that up? Oh, people are doing it all the time. What I believe this verse does is it smacks in the face of something that, that uh, over the millennial, uh, the, the, the countless years, has been established as a, a theology or a doctrine which we do not hold to here at our church. And it's the theology of once saved, always saved. The idea is that once I said yes to Jesus, well, nothing, nothing could ever change that. I don't think that's accurate. Here the Bible says, if you continue in the faith, established and stay firm and don't move from the hope of the, of the gospel, we have to stay the course. Are you thinking to yourself, well, what does that mean? I mean, I, I, I want to just very clearly tell you a few things, and I don't want you to misunderstand a thing that I'm saying. Don't leave this room quoting me in a different way. I believe God will never let go of us, but we can let go of him, and we do it all the time. Stay the course. Continue in the faith. Hold on to him. Don't let go. You may be thinking that, well, that's starting to sound a little bit, John, like, like you're saying that there's salvation through our works, that somehow we're saved by our works. No, the gospel of Jesus Christ refutes that all the way through. It, we are saved only by grace. Did everyone just hear what I said? Not by works, lest we can boast. We're saved only by grace. But hear me, grace is not opposed to our effort. Grace is opposed to thinking we earn it. That somehow we can do something to earn salvation. We can't earn, we can't do anything to earn salvation, but we can add our effort to this. We can say, I'm gonna hold on to God. I'm gonna stay firm. I'm gonna stay steadfast. I'm gonna keep moving forward. I know what I once was. I know who I am in Christ. And moving forward, I wanna be a disciple that lives righteously, knowing that we all fail. Every one of us do. 
but we have a point to come back to. No, I am holy, blameless, and I am free from accusation from the enemy. We have salvation by grace, not by works. We can't earn our salvation, but we can put our hand to the plow and not look back. And so I want us to be those kind of people. So as we pray, as we finish, do these three things with me in these moments we have together as we close. Remember back to what you were before you knew Jesus. And some of you, I'm gonna give an opportunity if you don't know the Lord to pray with me about that. But for the majority of us in this room, remember back. Remember, just even for a moment, don't dwell on it. Don't stay there. Don't allow the enemy to stir that back up. But you just take a moment to go, I remember what my life was back then. And then just say, Lord, thank you for this place that you've brought me to. It's the place of the cross. It's the crux of the matter where he pronounced you holy, blameless, and free from accusation. And then say, Lord, how would you want me to live moving forward? What do you want my life to look like? And begin to allow him to paint a picture in your own spirit as to what he sees about you. Let's pray about that. Lord, we thank you for this passage of scripture, this thesis. And we trust that you have placed this in the scripture for us, even for a moment like this today, that we can consider, we can remember what our life was like back then. For some that have had uh, a pretty painful past, Lord, that may not be difficult. For others, they may be struggling through, well, what does that mean? I've grown up in a fairly good home or had good parents or I've kind of grew up in church. And, and Lord, even to those, I would say that we can just take a moment to say, but God, where was I separated from you? Where did I not fully surrender? Where was I doing this on my own? It's no different than the long litany of, of, of heinous sin you had to rescue each and every one of us, Lord. So we consider that for a moment. We allow that, Lord, to move us to a place of honor and esteem for you, for providing a way for us to be right, for us to come back into relationship and experience the intimacy with you, oh God, through Jesus on the cross. Some of you may have not have said yes to that, you may not have surrendered your heart to Jesus yet, and you're missing that moment. You can see what your life was then, but you're having a hard time picturing what it could be moving forward because you've not submitted your life to the Lord. Or others of you today, you're like the ones who perhaps let go of God. You started doing it on your own, and you haven't stayed firm and steadfast and established and continued in your faith, and today you'd like to come back to the Lord. Regardless of where you're at, we give you an opportunity to pray this in your heart and then respond. Just pray, Jesus, I want you to save me. I want to come back into relationship with you. And I thank you for your forgiveness of sins, for the righteousness that I can, I can receive from you, for the freedom from my past, from the shame and the sin. And I decide now to grab on to you unswervingly, holding on to the hope that is found in you. Thank you for holding on to me. In Jesus' name. Lord, the picture that you're giving us now of what we can become is such that, that the old is gone and the new has come and, and we can walk in your life and with your grace and with your truth and and we can continue to serve you wholeheartedly, Lord. Doesn't mean perfection, just means a pursuit. So we pursue you, in Jesus' name.